Welcome to the American Folklife Center's 2022 Homegrown at Home concert series. I'm Stephen Winnick. For many years, we've presented the Homegrown concert series featuring the best in folk music and dance from around the world in various rooms and spaces around the Library of Congress here in Washington, DC. But in the year 2020, because of the global pandemic, we shifted to producing an online video concert series, which we call Homegrown at Home. So now in 2022, this is our third year of homegrown at home concerts. We're still being cautious about bringing audiences together. Now we have long known about Julian Katasti's work as a musician and scholar of Ukrainian traditions, and we're very glad to have him in the series this year. I'll just say that he's a third generation player of the Bandura, and he's known not only for renditions of Ukrainian folk and traditional music and epic songs, but also his own compositions, theater music, and world music collaborations of all kinds. Now, to get some more background and context for our concerts, we like to interview the performers whenever we can. And so I am here today with Julian Katasti. So welcome, Julian. We're very glad to have you. Hello, Stephen. Now, I guess sort of the elephant in the room nowadays when we're presenting Ukrainian traditions is the war that's going on right now in Ukraine. Um, uh, and so just wondering if you if you could say a few words about that from the cultural perspective. Well, no kidding. It's uh, it's the elephant in the room. It's, um, you know, it really has affected uh, so many people in so many ways and uh, uh, and continues to do so and will continue to do so. Um, but uh, the way that uh, that I finally uh, uh the way that i decided for myself you know how to deal with it uh for this uh, specific concert and i think probably in more of my work going forward is um um i um i heard somebody right near the beginning of the war uh talk about how this is these are like the first days of this big war which is really a war that's been going on for eight years, which it has since 2014 in Crimea and Donbass. And, and that eight-year war is just the latest, uh, the latest uh, iteration of a 400-year-old conflict, uh, which started uh, when... Uh, uh, when uh, uh, Moscow's imperialist project uh, started trying to move into Ukraine in a big way in the 1600s, yeah, you know, and what looking at it from that kind of historical perspective, which is which is something I do anyway because uh, I'm, uh, I, I am um, deeply interested in history, not just of Ukraine, but uh, just in history as a discipline. Um, but uh, looking at it in that, from that historical perspective, uh, it really uh, helped. It helped me um, relate to my repertoire, relate to the things that I have been doing, that I will be doing, um, in th that context. And all of a sudden, a lot of things started to make sense. Um, uh, a lot of the songs that I've been do that I'm going to do in this program are uh, songs uh, from uh, the 1600s, early 1700s, and I've been doing them for years. Um, and I realized that whether they're specifically historical songs or not, uh, they're uh, uh, they come out of the context of that historical struggle. Uh, one way or another, and um, and what they uh, let us do is hear the voice of the people of that time, and of intervening times, the people who made those songs, the people who passed them on uh, from generation to generation, the people who collected them and wrote them down. Uh, they were all influenced at various times uh, by what was going on in this. Uh, in this fundamental uh, conflict of values and civilizations, mm -hmm. so it's a it's a way to uh, 
uh, you know, doing these songs uh, today is a, it's a way to you know, hear the ancestors speak. You know, to have at least, uh, uh, and of course, then relating to the song, you're speaking back to them too. Sure. And I, I mean, another fascinating thing about uh, about your being the presenter of this concert and the performer is that your own family is part of this this 400 year history in a sense, mm -hmm. um, and the the family history of of how you came to this country has to do with this conflict. Could you tell the story a little bit about your family's arrival here? Well, they're um, uh, like like you mentioned, Steve. I'm a third generation player. Uh, my father and grandfather uh, came to the United States as professional players. And uh, my grandfather and his brother were part of a, uh, of a small group of professional players um, who, um, who ended up start, um, coming together and starting to perform in outlying villages around Kiev in the first winter of the German occupation uh, after the after the the Nazi invasion in 1941 uh, they were playing in the villages for food you know and uh, did that for a while and then um, and then at some point uh, um, and then in the in the summer of 1942 the whole group was uh, uh, basically put on a Put in a cattle car and sent to Germany to uh, uh, initially to work in uh, as uh, essentially slave labor in the in the factories, uh, which of course happened to millions of Ukrainians at that time, uh, especially young people. And uh, uh, you know the the group had made my father uh, official student, uh, which meant that he didn't get rounded up on his own. You know, and, and the, uh, but so and, and it very very possibly saved his life. You know, but mm -hmm. uh, but what it also meant was that when the group got put on the cattle car, he went with them. Right. So you know, so that that was my, that was my father's experience. You know, living through World War II uh, in those circumstances and uh, uh, as a fourteen-year-old kid, um, but. Um, as, you know, but they they were lucky. You know, they they ended up being able to uh, make their way to Bavaria at the end of the war and into the U.S. occupation zone, and and then uh, four years of uh, refugee camps, displaced persons camps, uh, after the war, um, which they used to practice. You know, and the whole group came as a group to the United States. Yeah, how did they manage that? That sounds like uh, it would be very complicated to to figure out. Well, it, it was, uh, but uh, in, it was 1949 when um, uh, they were looking for a chance to go someplace mm -hmm. out of Germany. Uh, by 1949, uh, the people from those camps were being admitted to the United States, Canada, Australia, uh, other countries, and, um, and uh, they managed to... Uh, and they managed to, to work it out where uh, they all uh, they all went more or less at the same time and they all went to uh, the Detroit area mm -hmm. you know and so they had been sort of in in exile from Ukraine already for mm -hmm. almost a decade by the time yeah yeah well, yeah. yeah eight years yeah 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 that's amazing mm -hmm. yeah. so um so so arriving here um, they were sort of lucky to have a built-in group uh, to play with, but how did they find um, the Detroit area as, in terms of the Ukrainian population there? What was... Well, there, there, was, a, there was a large Ukrainian population and uh, um, already, uh, you know, going back to the earlier immigrations uh, from um, uh, the turn of the century and from between right. wars, um, <clears throat> but also a large immigration came to Detroit from the displaced persons camps because because there were jobs, you know, there were all these uh, factory jobs. And, yeah. and uh, early on, that's that's what they did. Uh, you know, they, they all would get a would get a factory job. And then uh, when <clears throat> there was a chance to go on tour with the group, they'd, they'd all quit and then 
<laughs> we'll come back and uh, come back in a month or two and uh, get a different factory shop. <laughs> Uh, so it was a little bit easier to do that back in those days. Yeah. So, so they, uh, you know, so they were did that eventually. After a while, they realized they couldn't, they really couldn't uh, keep a group that size. It was about twenty people going, uh, going um, uh, as a solely as a professional music ensemble. Uh, but uh, so at that point they. You know the tours became less frequent, and they uh, but they still did it. They were they went uh, they actually went back to Europe in 1958. They did uh, they toured all all over North America, and and they kept the group going long enough for uh, my generation to learn the instrument and start uh, start taking the place of some of the older players. So uh, the, the, those are my first touring experiences. Was sure. Uh, yeah, so with, so explain how you started to play uh, and be part of this tradition. Yeah. Well, I I learned um, I learned uh, directly from my father, uh, who also was teaching kids um, uh, in Detroit. He started a youth youth ensemble, and uh, and and there were other groups like that started at that time. So. So actually, by, by the time um, by the time I was in my by the time I hit my twenties, uh, there was actually some demand for instructors uh, and players in different parts of North America, uh, and I started doing that. I started uh, traveling around the U.S. and Canada, uh, teaching summer workshops and things like that. I, I could kind of play by then. <laughs> 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 but I can't can't pretend that I really knew what I was doing, and then uh, and then in 1980 I, I got an offer from um, uh, uh, from an outfit called the New York School of Bandura, which uh, which was also a school teaching kids to play, um, and their um, musical director had had a fight with the administrator and they quit and quit, uh, uh -huh. so they were looking for somebody in a hurry and. You know, and I happened to turn up. So uh, the rest is the rest is history, as they say. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, so we're gonna. I'm gonna ask you some more about that that period and and the school. But maybe we could talk a little bit about the traditions that your um your your father and grandfather and great uncle brought with them, because there's there's you know words that people may come across when when talking mm -hmm. about Ukrainian music, like the Kobzar tradition. The Kobzar um, tradition, okay. What, what, uh, explain yeah. that a little bit. Well, uh, yeah, the Bandura is um, <clears throat> uh, considered in, in some ways a national instrument in Ukraine. And <clears throat> uh, a big reason for that is that um, for the last few hundred years, right about that time from the 1600s on, um, uh, the, uh, the bandura or instruments much like it were used to accompany epic songs uh, by uh, these blind singers, kobzeri. That's a that's a tradition that you find in a lot of in a lot of cultures. Yeah. Um, uh, epic singing by the blind, and um, um, <clears throat> and uh, the, the Ukrainian variant of that actually survived right up, right up until the 20th century. Uh, so we know a little bit more about it than uh, about the Kobziri than, than we do about some other uh, European epic traditions. That we know they existed, but we don't really, you know, have recordings or anything. But, um, <clears throat> but the, the Kobziri played a bandura uh, that looked uh, pretty much like this. And this is a reproduction of uh, of the of a kabzad instrument and it's um you can see it, it still has a lot of strings it has uh 22 i believe on this one and it's all um and it's a um, it's tuned uh, right now i have it tuned in um in a minor mode. 
All right, uh, which uh, can work either from there or. And uh, the Kabziri would uh, would play uh, uh, would would accompany themselves on this instrument with just a few chords because that's about all it can play. Mm -hmm. uh, it plays uh, it plays essentially three chords. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean, an interesting thing about the the bandura in general and the different kinds of instrument is that they're somewhat deceptively shaped because a lot of people see that, uh, you know, the tall part and they think that it's fingered like a lute or a guitar. But in fact, each string just plays one note. Is that right? Right. Um, the, <clears throat> here, the, the bass, uh, the two bass octaves only have three notes each mm -hmm. right? and, they're, and they give you the, the the three pitches yeah in two different positions that you need uh to accompany the epics and then um the um and uh, and generally it's not uh, even this type of instrument is generally not stopped on the neck yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, the a few of the Kobziri did a little bit of that, I think. But uh, even even on this instrument, the string tension is really too high. Yeah. Uh, to, uh, it needs to be to uh, to play uh, to play in the kind of style that um, <clears throat> that you need to play. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so this instrument was basically, you know, was used as an accompanying instrument for epic song. So the, the Kabzar would uh, start maybe on this higher chord. And then down here there's a recitation pitch so you can get on with the story for a little bit. Before cadencing and notice that you don't have to sing what you have to and you can you can do something different like right. play dancing right. uh, so uh, so the uh, so it was a accompanying instrument for this type of song and um, this is uh, as I say the instrument of the Kobziri of the blind singers mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the tradition that my father and uh, and, and that whole crowd brought uh, to the United States uh, because by the mid 20th century, uh, the instrument had uh, been uh, actually in the early 20th century. The instrument was picked up in the in the cities, right, uh, by sighted people, and um, and basically it evolved a couple of different uh, variants, and um, the. Uh, I'll go to the to this one here. Wow! It says, uh, <laughs> uh, this is the what uh, what is generally called the cave style bandura, which um, 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 is uh, which basically takes the idea of a all open strings instrument. And uh, and tries to answer the question of how can you play how can you play city music on it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, you put a lot more strings on it, right? So uh, right, so, so you have a pretty pretty huge range. Yeah. Um, but then, um, but also. Uh, it's probably not too visible on the camera here, but there's uh, uh, there's actually two layers of strings which cross right about here, mm -hmm. right? Like it's uh, it's designed so that this is the uh, this is the line of play for the right hand, mm 
And then right about here, this secondary layer crosses, which essentially functions exactly the way the black keys do on a piano, right? So. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So by putting a whole lot of a whole lot of so they put a whole lot of strings on it, uh, it made it possible to kind of play, you know, some chromatic chords and, um, you know, uh, uh, if you want to play. Uh, um, Francesco Terrega or something you can do that right but um, um, but what it uh, what it loses is first of all that the left hand here uh, is pretty much stuck on the bass notes mm -hmm. and there's a couple of ways of tuning them I, I use a diatonic tuning which uh, my great uncle developed uh, which uh, basically continues the tuning of the main row I see Gives, it gives me almost two octaves here, so I can do, I can also do rhythmic uh, bass accompaniments uh, for dance tunes, like. Uh, and, and, you know, just generally have a little bit more range in the bass. Uh, so. But this, uh, what this instrument does not do terribly well is play the old time music. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I found was uh, uh, because uh, because by the uh, by the sixties seventies, you know, when I when I was learning, uh, these instruments were actually being produced in Ukraine, and a lot of players were playing them, right? But the price the trade-off was that uh, they weren't playing anything remotely connected to the Kozar tradition interesting right? um so it was uh, you know so it had this nice little bit of kind of wooden embroidery all around it to make it look like a folk instrument but it really wasn't <laughs> in a lot of ways uh, so uh so what i found was um was that uh uh I was trying to, um, I was looking at some of the sources already uh, early on, even before I went to New York, and trying to figure out how some of this Kobzar stuff worked, but but it just did not come together on this instrument, right? And really it was only, um, it was only in the 80s of when I uh, first encountered uh, uh, reproductions of the old time instruments. Mm -hmm. But it really started to make sense. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, th this big one sounds. I mean, when you're playing it in the concert, it sounds almost like a harpsichord. It's got that, mm -hmm. you know, that very rich, um, yeah, yeah. high tension, high string tension sound. Yeah, it's high, it's um, high string tension. Yeah. It's it's all open strings. There's no there's no dampers, right? Yeah. So you know, if you want to damp, you have to you have to do it. Yeah. One way or the other with the, you know, so that's like a big, big part of playing is uh, figuring out how to get rid of all the extra sound. Yeah. Um, uh, but, um, but it's, um, um, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, it's a, it, it is, uh, it's an instrument which, uh, you know, which evolved as an answer to a particular set of yeah. uh, goals and questions. And uh, and it's been evolved even further than than this. There's versions of it now with uh, mechanisms that let you immediately change keys and you know, stuff like that. Because really, even though even with the chromatic layer, you can't really change keys easily on this thing. Uh, so it's uh, you know, so it's an instrument with its own trade-offs and its own uh, its own issues. Mm -hmm. But it's the one I grew up playing, and I still uh, I still like to pull it out and play it a lot right very nice mm -hmm. and, it, and and like i said a beautiful sound I, yeah. I i understand what you're saying about it not being perfect for the old yeah. time music but 
for what it does, it does really beautifully. So yeah, yeah. yeah exactly, exactly. So you know, it's uh, you know, I, I mean, I kind of, uh, I've had this, uh, I've had the attitude uh, for for many years now that, you know, that if you, you know, if you really pay attention, you know, to what the instrument is trying to tell you about what it can do and what it what it finds difficult to do right you know, it'll uh, it'll tell you you know and uh, you, just have to, you just have to pay attention you know or um yeah yeah and then you mentioned there was a second evolution out of the uh, out of the old time instrument as well which is one you also play yes uh in um in the 1920s <clears throat> in uh, kharkiv uh, there was um um, there was a group of, um, of uh, players, uh, mostly students of one of one guy. Uh, uh, his name was uh, Khotkevich, Hanat Khotkevich, and um, he'd um, he'd spent a lot of time with the blind singers, who still could be found at that time. They they were still doing their thing in, through the 1920s. Uh, so he spent a lot of time with them um, in in the early 20th century. Uh, he knew how to play their instrument, this this old time instrument that that I showed first, and he played it brilliantly. He played it virtuosically, <clears throat> right? And then uh, once there was uh, this idea of uh, in Kharkiv about well, where does this instrument go now? How, how can it? do something that's a little more modern you know how, how can it do something that's how can we open up new possibilities for it uh his um uh, his idea was not to change the instrument around very much you know uh, he would uh, uh, he, he he started playing with his students on the on the old time instruments and then added uh, just just very minimal additions here and there uh, first uh, just adding, uh, filling in the basses, uh, so you'd have more bass notes. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'd have a, a full a full scale of bass notes. Um, then, um, and then really evolving the idea which, uh, which the Kharkiv Kobzeri, Kharkiv area Kobzeri did practice of, uh, you know, using the left hand uh, uh, up, up high, and the right hand on the bases and mid range. Um, so, he, so his idea was that both hands should be able to go freely all over the instrument, right? And and he evolved the style and then uh, ba based on that idea and uh, and evolved the instrument, uh, you know, to meet the demands of the style, which grew organically out of what the blind singers have been doing. Interesting. Um, no, and it, it was very interesting. And he, he wrote, he, I mean, he composed a few pieces, both for solo and, and also for ensemble. Uh, the group that we talked about earlier that came to the United States actually had a couple of players from the ensemble that he had worked mm -hmm. with. And, um, and then, um, and then they, they were trying, they were uh, in, at the beginning of the 30s, they were starting to very carefully experiment with well uh you know maybe uh how do we get out of the diatonic modal scale and one of the things that they were working with was uh uh individual mechanisms uh, sharpening levers essentially yeah. strings right uh, so so they were just starting to do that they had a couple of different versions of it and uh, right about that time, uh, the political situation completely changed. You know, in the 1920s, there was a little bit of a truce in that 400-year uh, war, and Ukrainian culture was allowed to develop uh, uh, fairly, uh, fairly openly, so long as it uh, stayed, uh, so long as it stayed within the the political limits set by the party right? mm -hmm. uh, as long as you did that you could uh, you know you could evolve an instrument you know you could uh, look at old-time music right 
So long as you said, well, this is old time music. We're we're modern now, you know. <laughs> right. Right. But, uh, but you could, uh, but you could, you could do that stuff um, in the 1930s uh, with uh, with Stalin taking power, and there was this in incredibly uh, horrible uh, uh, reimposition of of. Uh, you know, just all, all, all this interesting work that was being done in the national cultures, uh, all, the, all across the Soviet Union, was uh, either outright repressed or uh, just really pushed into smaller and smaller boxes. You know, um, you know the result being the, the that, you know, yeah, so. so Smaller and smaller into small and smaller boxes, yeah, and uh, and so the the evolution at that point uh, took a break, you know, mm -hmm. the instrument, and the version of it that I play now, this is what would be called a Kharkiv instrument, mm -hmm. is um, uh, this is um, actually uh, the stringing pattern comes out of the uh, instrument workshop that the Bandurist chorus that my family came over with, uh, they set up, an, uh, the chorus set up an instrument workshop in the displaced persons camps, you know, because, uh, you know, to replace their worn out instruments. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, since they had a few of these Kharkiv type instruments to look at, they decided they would uh, build that, you know, and so they came up with a design uh, that was like this, which is uh, uh, has uh, 34 strings. Mm -hmm. uh, just a single uh, a single layer, so di diatonic uh, uh, diatonic stringing. Uh, but each string has a has a lever here, right? Uh, that can flip it by by a half step. So you can set it into a key before you start playing a piece. Yeah, that's that's pretty much how the how people have uh, how people used it. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's how the the ensemble certainly used it. Uh, we played these instruments, but that's the, that's what that's what we would do. We just set mm -hmm. up a key. Like right now, right now I'm at one extreme with everything open. It's three, mm -hmm. three flats, and it could go to four sharps if you if you shut everything down. Right. Um, but, you know, what uh, uh, What I've been doing, uh, you know, uh, uh, once I really got interested in this instrument, you know, I realized that here's this instrument, which has a little, you know, there's a little bit of repertoire, you know, left, left over from the 1920s, uh, but not a lot, you know, and... Uh, you know, so how do you, um, there's some, there's a little bit of uh, pedagogical stuff that Kukavich left, which gives some ideas about what he was doing with the instrument. Mm -hmm. But, um, um, but how do you, uh, how do you figure it out? You know, how do you, how do you get, how do you play enough different things to really yeah. figuring out what it does? Uh, so, you know, I perforce had to either, you know, make my own pieces or um, uh, uh, even more, just play a lot of improvisational stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and uh, that has, um, for me, has been, you know, just a heck of an experience, you know, just uh, letting, letting this thing tell me uh, what, uh, what it could possibly play, you know. And I mean, it can certainly play. Uh, it could certainly play the the, the old time music. And I can just do the same epic song that uh, that I did on the other, mm -hmm. on the other instrument, uh, but. Uh, uh, so it could certainly do that. It could be used for accompaniments. Uh, it, you can play most of the traditional Kabzar stuff on it. Uh, you, you can accompany uh, uh, songs, uh, uh, folk songs of different kinds. I'm, I'm particularly fond of historical songs also. Um, you know, so, so it's a question of 
for you know finding the right tuning for them and, and doing them. But also, um, there's um, there are other possibilities which until uh, which which haven't yet been totally explored, right? And one of them is well, what can you do with all these levers besides just tune um, uh, just tune your uh, uh, you know different different uh, uh, diatonic scales? Right. Well, you can tune. Uh, you could do something else. You could do. Uh, uh, let's uh, let's see here. I just want to do. Want to do? You can. Uh, uh, how about a how about a scale that uh, uh, that has? Um, um, yeah. How about a scale that has? Um, uh, let's say a C major scale. Take a C major scale as a start, but uh, flat the flat the A and sharp the D, right? Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got a mode that sounds like that. You have a little bit of. Right, a little, uh, almost a little bluesy kind of uh, yeah. scale there, but. You also have uh, so many leading tones in that scale that almost any random combination of notes will lead to almost any other random combination of notes. So, so you can you can just go ahead and play mm -hmm. and work out all kinds of uh, all kinds of technical uh, issues. And textures, and uh, different styles of tremolo. Mm -hmm. Different articulations, different, uh, uh, different. Um, yeah, just find out what the instrument can do. You know. Yeah. And uh, so that's uh, I've been having a you know pretty rewarding time doing that. That's you know, amazing for quite a few years now. Yeah, uh, well, I mean that's uh, you know so I'm finding like different uh, different scales. Uh, I've also, needless to say, being in New York uh, in the in the uh, late '90s and aughts, you know, I was hanging out. Uh, uh, at some of the downtown uh, free improv uh, mm -hmm. scene, um, and playing with people like Derek Bailey and uh, you know and, and, and others there. Cool. Uh, so um, you know, so so that's also part of it. Um, you know, just this aesthetic of uh, okay, here let's take a found object tuning, right? Right. <laughs> or what I just did, right? <laughs> That, yeah. Or, right. Uh, with this instrument, you've got a, uh, you have this incredible uh, uh, sound producing thing. Yeah. So it's been really interesting doing that, and it's been yeah. more interesting uh, the last uh, the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, uh, going back and forth frequently to Ukraine mm -hmm. and uh, sharing some of this with uh, with you know, players there, uh, not just Bandura players, but with other musicians and with audiences and uh, uh, using it also in theater music, you know, and uh, showing what it could do in, in that context. And, you know, it's really, uh, it really feels like uh, Continuation of this uh, of this ab uh, abruptly severed uh, tradition, you know, uh, of the Kharkiv Bandura from the, you know, from the twenties. They were they were moving in a lot of these directions. You mm -hmm. know? Uh, Kurt Kavish was doing a lot with texture. You know, he, yeah. was, he was finding other ways of expressing something musically than, you know, complex uh, chordal harmonies. Right. 
uh, he was um, uh, he was working with uh, some unusual modes. You yeah. Know? Uh, one of the people who picked up on him, uh, a player who was in New York in the 50s and 60s, uh, who unfortunately died before I could meet him. Um, but he actually did do the, the tuning I just demonstrated is one that he worked at. Interesting. Know? So there were people starting to do this. So, you know, so, so it's, um, so that's, that's another thing that, uh, uh, another thing that you end up doing of working with this instrument, especially in mm -hmm. culture is you have to kind of understand where it fits yeah. in that whole 400 year story yeah. and what happened to it, you know, and why, why the instruments are the way they are. Uh, why the music is the way it is what else could it possibly do what mm -hmm. what was left undone yeah. well an another aspect that we haven't talked that much about yet is your singing which is lovely and <laughs> how did you learn to sing uh in this tradition and and how did you learn ukrainian uh growing up as well mm -hmm. well learning learning ukrainian was uh that, that was the the automatic part right i was uh, uh <laughs> Uh, my my parents, uh, who knew a little bit of English, you know, well, my, my mother knew well. My father, uh, my father, uh, less so, but he, he he got to know English quite well. But uh, but they were the ones who knew English in the family, and they were they both worked, you know. Yeah. So when I was when I was a kid, I was uh, hanging out with grandma, uh, one or the other grandma. I was lucky enough to have them both, you know. And um, and with uh, one grandma's sisters and all these other older relatives that and older people, uh, you know, uh, that uh, in their circle who really didn't know English at all, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so I grew up I grew up speaking Ukrainian. I, I learned English when I went to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but uh, the singing uh, the singing also, you know, it was. Uh, uh, it was just something that everybody around me did, you know. Uh, uh, on my mother's, uh, my father's side, uh, you know, came out with, uh, came to the United States with that group. My, on my mother's side, uh, my grandmother and her aunts uh, were all uh, superb choral singers, mm -hmm. and uh, they also in the displaced persons camps, they were, uh, they were members of, uh, uh, of. of probably the best uh, mixed choir, you know, uh, in that uh, immigration, you know, and, and uh, so, so the, so there was a lot of, uh, a lot of that. And, uh, you know, my grandfather, uh, before he became a Bandurist and, you know, and, and ended up uh, doing that whole uh, odyssey, you know, the, the, during the war. Uh, uh, he actually studied before the revolution. Uh, he studied in one of the monasteries in Kiev, uh, church music. Mm -hmm. And when he came to Detroit, he started conducting the church choir, you know, so, uh, so that was, you know, my early experience, my, yeah. my great aunts were all singing in it. Uh, my grandfather was conducting it, you know, so I started singing soprano in the choir Great. and just kept going. So you had music on both sides of your family, Absolutely. really. Thank you okay. Very much. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, um, so we talked about your uh, leaving Detroit and going to New York, um, mm -hmm. and uh, there's of course that great Ukrainian neighborhood and Ukrainian crowd mm -hmm. there in New York, that strip between St. Mark's Place and, and Ninth uh, on Second yeah. Avenue, where Veselka is, and all that yeah, stuff. That's that's, that's a, exactly where uh, where I live. <laughs> uh, <laughs> excellent. So I grew up in Manhattan myself, so it's my my hometown. Um, but um, but how did you find? Did you find any cultural differences between the sort of New York Ukrainian crowd and the Midwestern group that Midwestern you came group. from? Um, well, you know a little bit, uh, but it was um, the. I mean, the differences in the Ukrainian community across North America were not so much. Uh, from at least at least in 1980 when I came to New York, the difference was not so much uh, where they were, you know, but kind of where they came from. Yeah. 
there's a there's definitely a cultural difference between the uh, between the pre World War II immigrants who were mostly economic immigrants uh, from yeah. what used to be Austria Hungary and then Poland after the war and now the western part of Ukraine. Um, uh, the, there was a big difference between them and the post-war displaced persons who uh, were from um, were from all over Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, although the um, still uh, with more more people from the West, simply because they had more time to get out. You know when uh, when the when the Red Army started moving east, a lot of people just decided they were going to take their chances and you know try try to get uh, try to get into Western Europe. You know, yeah. so uh, so the ones who uh, so n not all that many people made it from Eastern Ukraine, and yet that's where both sides of my family are from. Mm -hmm. And uh, the community I grew up in in Detroit, uh, that particular parish. Uh, where my grandfather was conducting and the great aunts were singing in the choir, uh, was uh, made up primarily of of people who um, who came from Soviet uh, Eastern Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, and um, and um, they um, uh, so. Uh, a very large part of the of the families were people who'd uh, <clears throat> who'd been caught up in the labor conscriptions. Uh, almost everybody, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, that was about the only way you could make it. You know, sure. out of, uh, places like Sume, where my mother was from, or uh, near Poltava, where my father's family is from. Um, but um yeah so so there was a little bit of a a little bit of a difference there you know like in, in new york was I, new york was actually the first time i had to i had to deal extensively with uh, some of these other uh, uh some of these other um uh, uh um parts of the ukrainian immigration with these yeah. you know, staying in on seventh street initially in a in a room in, in an apartment of you know, of people who were, I think there were 80 something and 70 something, a couple. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think he had, uh, uh, he had come from Ukraine when he was like four or something. And she was, she was born in New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, I mean, that was a bit of a culture shock. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then, uh, the, and dealing, um, yeah. So, so yeah, New York. Uh, but you know, what was amazing about it in retrospect was that you know here, here, here I was a twenty-one-year-old kid, you know, uh, who could kind of, sort of, you know, play this instrument and maybe teach a few tunes to kids, and yet there was enough of a community there enough uh, support enough demand uh for uh you know some kind of uh, for that kind of music that uh, that i was able to uh, keep going you know that i was able to um uh uh eventually eventually more or less make a living make a living <laughs> yeah well i mean pretty early you were able to for example tell us about that town hall concert that you organized in the, oh. in the 1980s i mean that had an enormous number of players that you found oh yeah 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 well what what that came out of was uh, we had um um uh, that was um in the early 80s uh, and the uh, the biggest part of the uh, of you know my extended generation the, of you know the, the kids who were born in in the United States, but to parents who'd come who'd come over uh, um, out of the DP camps. Um, the, the biggest part of that generation was. Uh, hitting their teens, you know, the, the years when you could actually, you know, make some kind of a Bandura ensemble out of them. Yeah. 
and there was a lot of demand for it. And we were doing a lot of uh, summer uh, camps at that time. Uh, we started doing a big one in Pennsylvania in 1979. And uh, from a couple of years of that, there were, uh, uh, you know, there were, you know, dozens of fairly proficient players uh, and all over the U.S. and Canada, maybe, you know, hundreds of kids mm -hmm. who've been uh, uh, going through workshops and uh, or going to regular lessons and uh, so uh, so we had we briefly formed this organization called the Society of Ukrainian Bandurists, um, which um, as one of its big things uh, uh, put together a couple of uh, huge concerts. You know, this was still the idea of. You know, the more Bandura players you can put <laughs> on one stage, the better. You know, uh, you know the nightmare, of course, that uh, you know the you know the organizers all think of the great picture they're going to get, the great photo, right, uh, of all these kids in national costume with with the instruments. But uh, you know, the nightmare of those concerts was tuning all those Bandura. Yeah, <laughs> without, I was thinking just uh, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah before the little chord uh, gizmos you know yeah yeah i was just thinking of the the the, the outrageous number of strings <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah. you know i mean the those uh, those big cave style instrument uh, yeah uh, mostly had like 55 strings right right uh, so multiply that by 125 which is what we had on stage at town hall uh you know <laughs> <laughs> that gets uh, that gets pretty extreme. That, that was a, yeah. I remember this being a real operation, you know, trying to, you know, it had to be meticulously planned, and you know, there was a whole team that did it. You know. Yeah. But you know, it got done, and um, and we were able to do these. So we did um, uh, we did one concert in um, this would have been Christmas time, nineteen eighty three. You know, the holidays there. We did. Uh, we did, uh, uh, I think, five or six numbers in Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto uh, for a big uh, Ukrainian World Congress um, and that was going on there. So that was the first time we did something like that. And I think we had even more there, 100, 100, almost 150. But, um, but uh, and my, my great uncle who'd... Uh, uh, Harihori Kitasti, who was a composer and conductor and had been conducting that uh, Bandurist chorus uh, uh, based out of Detroit, you know, for, for all those years since, uh, you know, since the war. Uh, he was still around and he conducted that Maple Leaf Gardens concert that was actually about the last thing that he did. And, um, uh, and, and we already started planning uh, the town hall one and by by next year by the next year he'd passed away already but we just went ahead and did it anyway uh, so um uh so i was we had several conductors i was one of them uh, a couple of my younger a couple a couple of my friends from from my groups in new york and um, uh, my father conducted a couple of numbers great so uh you know so so that was uh, that was one heck of a thing you know to just uh, but uh, you know that was that was the kind of thing we did then, and um, uh, the, these ensemble things, and uh, uh, and by 1987, 88, that whole wave had completely passed, and we couldn't find a student uh, with a searchlight, you know. Wow. And uh, you know, so the New York Bandura, New York School of Bandura, went into hibernation for a while uh uh i couldn't make ends meet in new york i ended up going to canada for a while and teaching yeah. in a school up there for a few years you know so uh yes yeah. it's all cyclical yeah. yeah yeah absolutely well one thing i i found really interesting and wanted to talk you to talk about a little bit was um that combination of sort of concert tour and field work that you did in Brazil and Argentina, because yeah. um, that is just, I think like folklorists would be really attracted to that. So how did that come mm -hmm. about and when, well, when was that? That was exactly this time that I, that I was talking about, uh, 87, 88. 
Mm -hmm. um, when we weren't really getting uh, much happening in New York. Uh, so I was at loose ends, and so was our administrator for New York, uh, the School of Bandura, a man named Nick Chorney, um, amazing, amazing guy. Uh, and he'd, uh, he, took a, he, he took a trip down to, uh, uh, down to Argentina and Brazil uh, one year uh, because he'd heard that there were uh, large Ukrainian communities there. And lo and behold, there were. Uh, there were uh, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians down there, uh, mostly in uh, rural areas although some had moved into the big cities, but, uh, uh, but mostly the, there was a lot of still rural communities. Uh, mostly these were people who'd come from Austria-Hungary, mm -hmm. you know, back uh, at, the turn, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century. Uh, at the same time that a lot of Ukrainians were going out to the Canadian prairies, where I'd also I'd been already and done, done a lot of work out there. But um, and the difference was that uh, uh, the, the ones who went to Canada, you know, they, they had a tough first winter, you know, in their dugouts on the, on, in their sod huts on the prairies. But after that, the railroad came through, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Canada kind of caught up with them. Right? Yeah. Uh, in uh, Brazil, uh, they were pretty much just uh, dropped in the middle of the forest in southern Brazil in Paraná province and left to fend for themselves. You know, so so it's a little bit different history, you know. And at the time that I went in 1987, some of those communities were just getting, uh, had just had the electricity get to them. Wow. So, uh you know so there was like there was still like just you know one or two radios in the whole in the whole village right you know that kind of stuff so uh, so that was uh um, it was an interesting time to go there very interesting uh i went there because uh mr chorney had uh he saw um a need in the urbanizing Ukrainian communities there, people moving into the cities. Well, they'd come into the cities and then they would immediately assimilate, you know, mm -hmm. into either Spanish or Portuguese speaking, uh, but, but into the, the local city culture. And, um, and he figured that uh, if it worked in North America to, you know, use uh, instruments like the bandura to give a um, kind of some kind of point of cohesion for some some of the teenagers, the kids, and um, uh, so they could have something something Ukrainian in their lives, you know, so keep them keep them involved with the community. He thought, he thought that would be a, a good thing to do. So you know, being the way he was, he immediately raised a whole bunch of money, uh, uh, bought, uh, had donated, uh, you know, wheedled people. You know, for for a whole for like a hundred banduras, I think it eventually ended up being more. Uh, uh, he put my friend uh, Ken Bloom, who was living in New York at the time. Uh, I don't know if you knew Ken uh, at that time. You know, but, but he was uh, he was building some banduras then, and and cool. Charlie had him build I think thirty or forty of these little children. Uh, the children's part keeps keeping doing it, you know. Uh, so we had those, and uh, so he sent all these instruments down there, and then uh, sent me down after the instruments to do. Uh, uh, so I did workshops in all these uh, in in, uh, in Buenos Aires, in um, uh, small towns in Misiones province, which is where the biggest part of the settlement is in Argentina. Uh, then uh, on the other side of uh, uh, of the border in Parana province, um, where there's just uh, still like whole areas that, uh, you know, it's like if you picked up, uh, if you like picked up a whole um, a little administrative uh, 
uh, like a township or yeah. whatever out of out of uh, out of uh, ni- 1910 Galicia, right? And plopped it in the middle of the forest in Brazil. Right. <laughs> You know, it's it's just you know it's pretty amazing. So um, anyway, the uh, so what I ended up doing was uh, teaching courses, uh, but then um, I also uh, I also would go around to a, a lot of these smaller places, even out into the villages, uh, and play. You know, and um, and then in those villages. Uh, uh, sometimes it'd be, you know, um, sometimes it'd be a chance uh, to uh, record uh, somebody, uh, some local singers or musicians, you know. So, so I was doing a little bit of a little bit of that as well, mm-hmm. and um, uh, eventually the the recordings ended up in the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies out in uh, in Edmonton. Yeah, and. Uh, um, uh, just uh, quite a quite an amazing quite an amazing experience, you know. Um, I, I, it just I, yeah, it just sounds so fascinating. <laughs> I mean, just uh, it, it was. I mean, just uh, I mean, literally, we would uh, you know we'd pull up to pull up to the village church uh, in a beat up old uh, VW Beetle, you know that. You know they were driving me around in, and ring the bell. You know, just start ringing, and ringing the bell, and you know, and after a few minutes, people would come to see what was going on, you know? and then uh, and they say, "Well, this uh, this guy from from New York is here. He wants to play some Ukrainian music for you." Okay, you know, <laughs> that, that seemed interesting. So you know, so then just wait around and about. And about half an hour, an hour, you know, whoever wanted to come would be there, and the play for him right there outside on the steps. Mm. And uh, did they know about Bandura music? I mean, had they? Did they remember? Uh... Not, not so much because they were again they were mostly from the Austro-Hungarian part of the yeah. country, and the the Kobzari tradition actually is. Uh, for all that it became a national symbol, it became that for not because there was one in every house, you know. Yeah. Uh, it was actually a, a very localized tradition, yeah. uh, uh, kind of between Kiev, uh, Chernihiv, Sume, you know, a lot of the names you're hearing on the news, you know, yeah. like that area kind of east of, uh, immediately east of Kiev. Yeah. You know? Uh, and down to the to the beginnings of the steppe, down to Poltava and uh, and um, and you know, the, there, um, so the, that was primarily where, where where that tradition was was focused. So the the people who'd gone to Brazil, of course, uh, came from um, they came from uh, a rural part of the country which uh, had no contact with that other rural part of the country. Yeah, you know, and uh, and so yeah, so for them it was like a new thing, you know. But uh, but they connected to the songs, you know. Uh, what, sure. we, what was really interesting was how much, um, um, how much they connected specifically to the Kabzar material. You know, like I'd sing this epic song about the um, about about a, a widow with three sons, you know, and. and and she gets old and the sons decide, you know, too much trouble taking care of her, but, you know, uh, throw her out of the house. And of course, uh, horrible things happen to them, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so that song, um, that song, they really, really connected to in a way. Uh, and humorous songs, you know, uh, like some of these comes out humorous songs, which have a village setting, they, they got it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, the other thing that I I really wanted you to talk a little bit about was your touring in Ukraine as one of the mm-hmm. first American Ukrainian artists to really do that. Um, so talk about how that happened. I guess that was a little later in the in 
89 or so. Yeah, that, that was almost almost immediately after. Yeah. You know, I actually, um, I think both myself and Mr. Charney were thinking that we'd be continuing this project. You know, mm -hmm. uh, um, I went down there twice in 87 and in 88 for a couple of months each time. Uh, but by 1989, um, uh, it was still the Soviet Union, but this was, uh, if uh, people know the history, this was already uh, perestroika going on. And, uh, and uh, you know, people were starting to lose their fear a little bit, you know, and it was possible to do more, um, more and more things. And certainly with Ukrainian culture, uh, uh, it was it was starting to be possible to do things, you know, without uh, uh, dealing with it, without without being immediately, you know, so subject to repression. Um, so in in 1989, um, uh, I, I had a chance to go and. Um, go over there for the first time through um, Canadian-Ukrainian joint venture uh, out of Toronto, actually called Kobza, mm -hmm. I, which uh, um, which was trying to uh, trying to make make some kind of cultural activity and exchange happen between North America and Ukraine. Uh, so we were their guinea pigs, right? It was a, a trio, myself, another uh, a very good guitar player from Toronto, uh, Victor Michalov, and a friend of ours, a singer uh, from the chorus, Paul Pisarenko. Uh, so three voices, two banduras, and we, uh, we put together a program uh, of, uh, especially of stuff that would not have been heard, you know, very much in Soviet Ukraine. So uh, on the Bandura uh, thing, it would be uh, like uh, Victor uh, played some of Kutkevich's music. Uh, 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 so, and demonstrated the Kharkivska Bandura. He was already playing that. Uh, he, he grew up playing that. So, uh, and I was still mostly playing the other kind, the cave, the cave instrument. But um, but I would show then you know some of the compositions by people like my great uncle, uh, some of the some of the music um, uh, some of the music from the which was created in in North America or in the displaced persons camps, uh, and. Um, You know, and then we do, we also put together a program which had uh, a lot of historical songs, um, a lot of uh, uh, material from the Kobzar uh, repertoire, or these religious moralistic songs, a few of those. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we, we each knew a couple of epics, you know, so we, we would do those. And... Um, and we and we went uh, we went over there and ended up um, ended up playing about a hundred concerts. Wow! In that season of eighty nine ninety, we did a couple of trips, uh, and you know just and all over all over all over the country. I mean, uh, not just in places like Lviv, although we were there a fair bit. But uh, also uh, Kiev, Kharkiv, uh, Zaporizhia, you know, uh, even villages out around, you know, and that was the best part that uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, we, we got to go to a lot of places, not, not everywhere, but a lot of places and yeah. see the, see the, um, the regional uh, capitals, the regional towns, and also uh, get out into the smaller towns and and even villages and in a lot of places, and uh, and we got to see what all that looked like, uh, circa 1989-90, as the Soviet Union was winding down. Yeah, you know, I, 
it, it must have been kind of extraordinary to bring Ukrainian culture, you know, this culture that you'd been so steeped in, um, and to actually get to go there and, and present yeah. it to people there. Yeah. It was, uh, I mean, it was just, uh, uh, I mean, I, I can't even, you know, I can't even find words for it. You know, yeah. it was just, uh, just really, I mean, mind blowing is about right. Yeah. That's, uh, um, uh, and, um, and then that's also when I, when I really, that was my very first time in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Victor had been before, but I, I hadn't. And, um, and that's where I may, uh, I met, you know, a lot of the people I'm still, uh, uh, I still consider my friends. I'm still in touch with, yeah. uh, you know, who I'm writing right now to see, you know, where they are, how they're doing. Yeah. You know, uh, but also who I've stayed in touch with over the years and, um, um, and I kept, I kept going back and meeting more and more different kinds of people, uh, uh, the, the theater, you know, the, the theater crowd through the theater projects that I did and, um, just, um, uh, I've done a couple of uh, very interesting electroacoustic collaborations with people doing electronic music there. Mm -hmm. You know that just fits so well with some of the some of the things I'm doing on, on the package. Yeah, and, uh, you know, so uh, so really, um, uh, I mean, since those trips in '89, '90, I've really uh, uh, I realized that I really was you know, the work I was doing was part of this culture, you know, and I mean, in other ways, it's also part of uh, North American culture, right, but, uh, but, uh, the, but, but I felt com very much at home uh, working uh, with people in Ukraine in, you know, on, in this, uh, uh, in the music that mm -hmm. uh, that we've been making, I've really felt a part of a part of the cultural development of the last thirty years. Well, and it should be said, you received a an honor from President Zelensky not that long ago. Um, explain mm -hmm. that, if you would. Well, the uh, well, the it's uh, uh, yeah, they they made me an honored artist of Ukraine, which is. You know, I mean, it's uh, uh, on the one hand, it's uh, it is kind of a throwback to these Soviet kind of titles. Yeah, you know, that they haven't that they hadn't entirely, you know, gotten rid of. Uh, so, so there, there's that a little bit. But uh, but you know, when when uh, when it was. Uh, when they when they said they wanted to give it to me, I was thinking, you know, this is uh, this isn't just for me, you know. Yeah. You know, th this is for all all those people, you know, who's uh, who remained unrecognized or who did their work uh, far away from Ukraine, you know. That's for all. Thanks once again to Julian Katasti for this wonderful interview and for the beautiful concert that you put together for us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for, for an interesting, uh, interesting chat. <laughs>